project-based resumes um, for proposals is what we're talking about. Um, so it sounds dry, but it won't be. So now the structure of this webinar is a bit different than the ones I've done before, because what we're gonna do, so what pieces are used for corporate proposals is actually, I put that first, but that's actually what we're gonna do at the end. Um, so we're going to talk about what to keep and how to keep it for proposals and how to select what's important and how you um, record all the pieces that you might want to put in proposals. So kind of a, a speedy method so that you're prepared and when proposals come up, you can act quickly. Um, and then we're going to talk about how, so the way that I'm going to begin is with what you're probably already familiar with. So what do we do as individuals to market ourselves and to show people what we can do? And then I'm going to give it a little comparison with um, academia. So how do proposals and CVs and resumes and stuff look in academia compared to what we do in industry um, and compared to what we do as individuals? It, it's uh, kind of fun to um, compare. Corporate proposals. So this is going to be the um, activity at the end. So maybe even workshop it a little bit. So uh, you're going, what you're going to do is write up just one project experience of your own and you're going to share it in the chat, I hope, if you're comfortable. Now, you might not know what that means yet, so don't worry. We're going to work through it. So um, as I mentioned, I think this webinar started off pretty boring. My, my mice cartoons, if you've been with me for a while, uh, you know I have mice. They went on strike. They're on holiday. Um, but Diane, uh, thankfully, wrote an exciting uh, introduction, which gave me a lot more energy for this webinar. So she said, are you planning to write a project proposal or a request for funding in the near future? Knowing how to approach and write exciting proposals is a valuable tool in your communication skill set. And it's true. You know, the, the word exciting is what we need. And I think one message I've tried to get across the whole time is just because it's technical doesn't mean it has to be gray and boring. And so finding this spark that sells is um, first of all, way more fun. And second of all, that's, that's what you wanna do when you're doing something boring is find something exciting. Um, so many technical documents are specifications. They describe complex situations or projects clearly and concisely. So you need to do that, right? You need to be able to do the complicated thing, but also add the spark of fun. So. Um, to persuade uh, bosses or clients or allocates budgets needs to excite the imagination and show possibilities and opportunities. So as you write that little thing that I just mentioned, and hopefully as you go forward after this webinar, you know, think of that. Think of this kind of inspirational little post from Diane. It has to be exciting, interesting. Think of the possibilities. So when you're selling yourself in a resume, which this webinar is not all about resumes, it's, it's focused more on projects, but the more experienced you are, the less you focus on what is, and you focus more on what you can do. So write that down if you have a pencil. You're not focusing on what you are or what you did. You're focusing on what you can do. It's a, it's a subtle difference, but it makes a big difference. So what can you do? Um, we will also, so now we get to the boring way that I originally wrote this, discuss a few tiny issues that cause anxiety. Because I know when you don't know the rules, you can waste a lot of time looking for the rules. Um, but when you know the rules, you can break the rules. And so we're going to look at some. So let's start with something that seems boring, but can waste a lot of time. How do you punctuate your own name and your credentials? Here's how um, I actually asked this question recently on the editor's list. And I said, uh, which one of these would you do? Um, now, feel free if you have a, to vote. Marnie just put us a poll up there. Which one would you choose? And as a spoiler, the most common answer on the editor's list was none of these five, but it's a revision of one of them. So how do you do your name? Most people voted for the old fashioned choice. So most people chose A. Now, one of the editors voted for A and she admitted that she's kind of old school. So it used to be that we put periods on all of the degrees. And just like now with uh, BC for British Columbia or PEI for Prince Edward Island, um, people normally put um, no periods. The answer that people in the editor's list actually gave was not D, but add an extra comma in between the degrees, which is what I had for A, so kind of like A. Um, and then 
Uh, we have some other examples here. These two people this morning uh, were guinea pigs for the webinar, and this is how they write their credentials. So you can see Isabel, who's actually the youngest one in this list, she uses m.a. because that's what other people on the web page where she's listed do. Um, and Anne doesn't put the um, periods in, but then you can also see she has CTESL. So you may or may not know what CTESL means. Which brings me to this picture. Who are you? Are you a sailor? Are you a cowboy? Are you a spaceman? So, you know, when we put on a resume or even when we write our name, that is putting on a suit, right? So I actually, you might've noticed, added CYT, which I didn't have in the beginning. Now, I don't always add CYT because it means certified yoga teacher and yoga teacher isn't necessarily relevant, you know, for what I'm doing right now. Um, uh, and CTESL means a certified teacher of English second language. On this very helpful um, picture from, I think this is the 1940s, one of these cutout dolls, you can't read the writing down here, but it says on the spaceman mask that you need to cut very carefully children along this dotted line. So of course that you can see the doll's face. Now. If you put CYT for an audience that doesn't know about yoga teachers or TESL about people that are not English second language, that's basically like you haven't cut out the mask on the spaceman. You're hiding part of yourself by putting an acronym that's not explained. So if that's at the top of something that explains your, like if it's at the top of your resume and then the resume explains what you do, that's fine. It's not gonna be cloudy, but you wanna make sure you bring your audience with you and. That, that counts for even the way you write your name. Okay, so the way to sell yourself is to look like your buyer, not confuse your buyer. Um, and you want to look like exactly what your buyer thinks they want. So as we discussed in the persuasive writing webinar, which you can find on the website, you know, it's like mirroring body language. You wanna be familiar to the buyer. So even the way you write your name is like that. And the way you wanna write your resume, you wanna make sure it looks familiar and feels comfortable to whoever's gonna read it. So how can you show that you're similar to the company you're pitching to or that you fit their needs? So the first thing, um, and you'll see in the proposals list that we get to later, the first thing you need to do is, you know, make sure that you're selling well. So what can you do to look like the company you're pitching to? You can answer in the chat or you can make notes um, for your activity at the end. I'm going to, that's good, people are talking in the chat. Use their language and see their website, for example. So that's an exa exact thing, like how do you write your, punctuate your degrees and Isabel copied her, her own company's website. So that's great. Okay. So the other things we discussed were you want to have, this is from the persuasive writing webinar, you want to discuss your skills, experience, and values in ways that look like the person you're selling to. So for example, if you know that they're very committed to the environment, you would want to talk about your environmental commitments in the same language they use. So even when you're tailoring your project-based resume, you want to use the vocabulary that that company likes. And of course, um, nowadays with machine read re resumes and so much software that plows and trolls through things, we want to make sure that we're using the language that they're going to have programmed. Um, so it's worth checking in and, and checking what they've got. Um, now interests. So I want to say about the interests here, a lot of business used to be done in the bar. So I even saw something on the, the website, ask a manager about if you don't do the same socializing as the other people, you get left out of opportunities. So how do we shape this into project resumes? Well, this is why we need to consider this question. Should you include the fun volunteer or hobby parts about yourself? And then why or why not? So an example for this is one of the guys I interviewed for our careers module. Um, is a rugby player. And he was saying that he has gotten a fair number of jobs because from other people who play rugby. 
Um, you know, if you get to know somebody through any interest, you know, volunteering at the SPCA, um, then having those parts uh, in common can really help you to snag a contract. Um, another woman I interviewed was saying she used to volunteer with the Peace Corps. And because she had volunteered with the Peace Corps, uh, one of the bosses at a place that she applied, she was just a little woman and she was going to work with a whole bunch of big men. And the, and the boss said, oh, if she's volunteered with the Peace Corps, we're hiring her immediately. No more questions. And the other people weren't going to give her a chance. So I would say that, yes, on your resume, you should find some aspects about the fun. Should you include your photo? You might just want to make this little note in your own thing. So if you were in Europe, um, a lot of the resumes do require your photo and your age and your gender identity, um, which in Canada, of course, isn't really legal for people to require here. Um, but what do you think about your photo and how you use it? I know that some, some places hotly debate this. So now we're going to look at three different types of resumes and CVs. We're going to look at personal careers, corporate careers, and then academia, as I mentioned. So now I'm going to do a little departure from previous webinars in that I'm going to be going off of this program. So it's going to look a little awkward slightly. Um, so for your personal career, you've got your curriculum vitae, which is what we're going to discuss has everything. So we're going to look at a corporate curriculum vitae at the end of this. Then you might have a website, which honestly, if you were going to do a website or a resume today, I would say do the website because your website is your resume. It's worth putting some effort into. Um, a portfolio shows people what you can do. It's examples of your work. Um, and again, we can now put the portfolio right on our website or we can upload that portfolio on our LinkedIn profile. So this one mouse um, came off vacation just to show us the pieces that we're gonna go off of PowerPoint to show you. Um, and then another thing that is very important for any kind of proposal or any kind of job is your known reputation, word of mouth. Now, there's some interesting ways you can do word of mouth online, right? So obviously, I, I know when I worked in downtown Calgary, I was stunned to the level that people just looked at your face and they're like, oh, this is Krista, she's really good. And I thought they don't have any evidence that I'm good. They just see my face, that's it. So word of mouth can really count, you know, or maybe somebody else said something, I don't know. But so how do we access that word of mouth on paper? First thing I wanna to look to is web page. Yes, testimonials, that is exactly it. And here I am fumbling around. Okay, so here's a web page um, of a guy I know, John Westland, fantastic guy. I worked with him at Golder. Um, so you can see immediately what he does, right? He he digs under the ground. Um, you can see that he's got a sense of humor because he's the truth is down there. He's made a joke already right on the first page. Um, and then if you look at team, you can see that his photo is beside his bio. And you know, now that we're all used to LinkedIn and Facebook, um, a lot of people are used to using their photo. And I think that your photo is often a sign of your character. And I know sometimes people say, oh, it's not fair. I don't, I mean, you can use an avatar if you have some reason for thinking your photo isn't good. But I think that using a good professional photo um, it's, it's worth actually investing some money to get a proper professional photo. I know um, I've seen the difference in professional and non-professional photos that I've had myself. So that's something to do now. Let's look at a portfolio. So here's one from uh, Isabel Laduceur, uh, Seguin. And so she um, has her website. So this is her, her business website. Uh, she just shows you, she, so she does plain language editing in English and French. Um, but the thing that's interesting is to see the work that she does. So if people want to know her writing skills, uh, they can see it right here. Um, I know that I also got a big writing contract one time simply because I have more than 100 articles on LinkedIn. And so the manager said, well, obviously you can write um, just by benefit of that. So it's worth keeping a blog if you can write, which a lot of people here have said they're technical writers. And if you want to keep a blog and you don't know how to get topics that you're expertise in, um, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to have a little brainstorm 
uh, phone conversation with you, you probably have a lot of knowledge you could put on blog articles and you should put on blog articles or LinkedIn articles to showcase your knowledge. It, it keeps it. Um, so then testimonials somebody else mentioned, and I'm also showing, th so this is um, off of my webpage. So one thing is I, I tried to strip this down and have like no words. So all I have is a picture about what I do. Um, and then instead of me saying, I'm really good at this and I'm really good at that, um, I just got these other people to say that they liked working with me. And so I'm showing you this page also to say, this one here that has no photo, unless you happen to know Salish, it doesn't seem as credible as the ones that do have a photo. So, and, and here again too, okay, well, we think that Sean Say is a person, but we don't see his face. So it's, it's interesting that difference. And here's a, also another way to show credibility, old fashioned. This was a proper letter with a proper signature. So your signature and your photo, so your photo online, is basically the same as a signature on a letter, I believe. That's my point. So now your LinkedIn profile can do all of those things for you. So you, you show your, your face and the thing I wanted to show you here. So featured items, you can use this as a portfolio. So I have like a blog article here. I have um, my UBC link in case somebody wants to find that. Um, I have a video that I've done. I have a resume. So you can put up anything you want in this featured item. And then down at the bottom, you can also put up things that people have said about you. And if you don't want to ask people for references, there's another sneaky thing you can do on LinkedIn, which is you can give other people references. So because I have written about the joy of working with all of these people, you could read this and get a picture of who I've worked with just by seeing if I said something about them, obviously that was a good relationship. And so you could, um, you can do that as a sneaky way to get talked about without, you know what I mean? I'm teaching you all the tricks. Okay, you have to wait to see this one. Going back to the webinar here. So academic proposals. So again, academic people are gonna have a CV, a website, lists of publications. So whereas with your personal CV, you're focused more on projects that you've done and skills that you have. In academia, it's kind of about what have you published, you know? And known reputation is gonna be more about people having read what you've published. Um, so let's take a little look at that. So before we go to Dominic's web page here. So here is um, a prof I work with, um, Dominic Lerivier. So he has been researching for 20 years or so. And he's got all of these publications, right? So this is one thing that he would include in a grant proposal would be this list of publications. Now, the way to select it, you'll see in a second, but other things that are important is also that he shows his current funding. So this, again, this is like a list of references. All of these committees decided to give him money to research. Obviously he's a good researcher. Um, also very important in academia, you know, his awards. And then he, he helps with admin and, and chairing things and volunteering with things and consulting with, with industry. So that, that appears up here. But it's actually pretty concise considering how much information is in here. Now, if you look to his web page online, it looks very stripped back, doesn't it? So this is very much following the rules because this is the university web page. So it says what he teaches. Uh, it says only some of his publications, um, then his training and his affiliations. So the people that he volunteers with. So it says here, you could see ResearchGate to see my full list. And again, very rule following, right? This is exactly how people in academia expect to see things. And because, it, because he's a chemist, he's got some nice pictures here, which the graphical abstract is a great thing these days. Now here's one of his colleagues in microbiology. So again, on the web page, it looks very straightforward, his teaching, his publication is affiliations. But now 
here's something really interesting. Instead of ResearchGate, it says go to the lab site of Steve Charette. So we go here and oh my gosh, it's not in black and white. It's all color because he's a microbiologist. So he's used um, microbiology. In fact, every time you refresh this page, you come up with another uh, microbiology photo, which is kind of fun. So again, he's got the long list of publications. Um, the strict editors would say, oh, it's on red and green. It might not be as readable, but you know, you also get a picture that he's more creative, that he's interesting. And then another thing where pictures really show you. So, okay, we can see he looks like a nice guy. And then when I just scroll, I see, okay, he's got three research professionals. And as I scroll, what do you notice about this page? Almost everybody on the team is a woman. If you were a grant proposal person and you were a woman and you wanted to back up people who work with women, this might be significant. And so having all of those handshakes, you really get a feel for the team just by seeing all of those pictures. You know, and other professors have big lab teams. You can see by the list of research um, and funding how many lab teams they have. But so using pictures and being colorful can sell. And again, I'm wanting you to think of all of this adding up to the industrial aspect. So now we're going to get to the corporate aspect. Let me just see what people said in the chat here. It makes a lot of sense. That's good. Do you need pers uh, permission to include comments in a photo? Yes, I would say you should always ask. And I do have permission from all those people. Yeah, I always ask. I mean, that's just good politeness as well. Corporate proposals, which is why we all came here. How is it different or the same? So first thing, it's not going to be a long list of, of um, publications, right? Academia has an appetite for this. Now with corporate proposals, we're gonna look at two pages here. So just to give you an overview of what's in a corporate proposal. So this is from our proposals course that we have in the micro-credential. Um, so a business proposal is, I'm just reading you this one paragraph here. A business proposal is a written offer of goods or services from a seller to a buyer. It's different from a tender because the buyer is considering more than the price. So a tender, you know, they often just say, how much will you do the job for? And they throw it out there and they see what comes back. Same thing with proposals. So a proposal focuses on added value and innovative solutions to the buyer's problems. So the proposal format gives proponents the opportunity to highlight competitive advantages and how the seller will help the buyer achieve its business goals. So one example I could think of is if you have a stellar environmental um, reputation, that could put you ahead even if your price isn't as low as somebody else. Or let's say that you're going to be working on indigenous lands and you happen to be an indigenous company, that would certainly hopefully get you a leg up as well. Or let's say that you have people on your team who speak Swahili and you're going into some African countries where people speak Swahili, that would definitely be a competitive advantage above your price, okay? So proposal gives you room for all of these colorful myriad details. You know, think microbiology pictures, think what's exciting. Um, typically a proposal is selected, solicited through a request for proposal. Um, the buyer will distribute, distribute the request for proposal and say, here's what we're looking for, you know, and then the sellers or, or you, submit their offers. So the response can be submitted as a document or through software program. And something which we didn't put into this book, but I'm starting to see come up is people put videos saying, here's why you'd want to hire me. Like we now have the capacity to uh, do that. You can have videos on YouTube showing you off. You can, as I showed you, you can slap a video right onto LinkedIn. It's a piece of cake. So in the context of a proposal, so there's going to be the cover letter, the title page, the table of contents, the summary. Um, the part that we're looking at here now is the qualifications. Okay. So within a proposal, if you're working in a large company, you're, they might have like 100 employees or in Golder's case, we had 9,000 employees. And then we make a corporate CV, which I'm about to show you. And that corporate CV goes into a giant database. and then the company can decide, okay, we're gonna go do this job. It's in Costa Rica. We need somebody who knows archeology. span We need somebody who's great in uh, Costa Rican Spanish. We need um, you know, 
some geotechnical people, we need some water people. So they'll go and they'll search through and find the team by the people who have the skills. A common one in Canada, of course, um, experience with Indigenous nations and training um, with Indigenous nations is good. Also, um, you know, say you've got experience in the Arctic. There's a lot of uh, specific things with working in the Arctic environment. So that is a very valuable thing to have on your curriculum vitae. So now here's what the curriculum vitae looks like. So this is a, like an old one of mine from Golder, which <clears throat> the more I look at, the more errors I find and things I could do better, but I'll tell you about what I could do better and then you can do better on yours. So, um, so here is, you know, you start with my name. Now on the Golder Curriculum Vitae, let's think of it as having two purposes if you're working in a large company. So I was working with 9,000 people and the fun thing about Golder was you could be helping people anywhere in the world. I talked to people from South Africa and Singapore and British Columbia and Alberta and California and Nevada, right? You, you don't know, but how do we all get to know each other? Well, it's kind of like internet dating. This is uploaded onto the uh, website and everybody can see everybody else's resume or curriculum vitae. So you can put things on here that are friendly. So Krista, in this third paragraph here, I put Krista grew up in the wilds of Kananaskis country and has a passion for responsible agriculture and industrial use and re restoration. So right away people could say, oh, Kananaskis, and that can start a conversation. So think of putting conversation starters in there. You don't have to scrub yourself gray. Okay, you can put conversation starters. The next thing that's gonna be in your curriculum vitae is of course your education, your certifications. Um, a lot of people will have you know, first aid in here and who knows, H2S and all kinds of stuff, um, any languages. And so um, a friend of mine who's a geologist, you see, I could also in here, I could put, I've got some Danish, I've got some Italian, I've got some Spanish but it's kind of like travel versions. Like I can speak Italian when I'm in Italy, but I would be too shy to speak it in Canada kind of a thing. If you're a geologist, that's more relevant. You know, the fact that he worked in Sweden and learned Swedish and he worked in Switzerland and learned German. And so that kind of thing may be appropriate if your job involves going to a lot of remote locations. The fact that you've picked up those languages and used them in situ says something about your character these subtle little notes, these subtle little notes. So next thing on here is employment history, which is would be similar to your um, personal resume, right? You put, put this down. Because this is a curriculum vitae, you should say everything. So I'm just gonna show you something here where I didn't say everything. Um, so for example, I talked about working at COSIA. Great, you know, I told you the name of the thing. Uh, the oil sands innovation lands. That's great. The site's not really that important. But then I talk here, okay, I worked at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology on reserve. Now, I just say on and off indigenous reserves. That's not actually the best way to do a curriculum vitae when you're within a company. What you should put is I worked in Sturgeon Lake and I worked in Peace River and I worked in Morley. Like I should say all of those things, the actual locations. And so I knew people at Golder who had 57 page CVs because they did include all those details. And so I know when I was 28 or 29 years old and you know, overly modest and trying to get on in my way, I had so many publishers that I had worked for that I thought it was silly that my resume was getting too long and I summarize them. And I regret that so much because I can't remember the names of all the publishing companies I've worked with and all the topics and all the projects. And so don't do that. Please don't do that. Keep a long, long curriculum vitae. And then you're going to extract the resume from your long one, but do not summarize and do not delete any of your experiences. Keep a long form. So discussing whether it should be in first person or third person. So this comes down to the fact that it had two purposes. So this first part here is more like the part that gives me the handshake to other people in the company, right? I tell people what I've done. Now, the second part here, the project experience is the meat of what we're gonna do in the um, activity here. So, oh yeah, I have this in first person too. 
I, I like first person, it's accountable. But you could also do it in third person. I mean, this might be um, pulled out. And if this was going to be used in a, in a proposal, for example, then they might say, you know, academic articles have edited uh, research. So they would probably say Krista has rather than I have, right? So that's the job of the proposal coordinators, as I said, to pull that. And then they would probably put that all into third person. I'm a very uh, friendly person. I tend to put things in first person. Um, so now let's look at these project experiences. So project experience, I put that I've done this kind of project and that kind of project and that kind of project and that kind of project. So this is where you would have, and this is how it becomes to 57 pages, right? So here's an example, uh, Shell. I worked with Shell, edited a number of papers about sand farming, water management, environmental protocols, and other aspects of their oil sands operations. So we're getting into technical detail here. Um, and then curl oil sands products. So we're starting to talk about specific names and specific projects. Uh, then down here, water smart, uh, you know, reports with water smart. Um, PTAC, the Petroleum Technology Alliance of, uh, of Canada. So listing specific names. Uh, listing specific universities I've worked with, listing specific sites, listing specific government agencies. So basically, there's no anonymity in this kind of a CV. Um, you don't have to put this on the internet for everybody to see, right? So here's the kind of things you want to make sure you include. And actually, I don't have the dates showing in mine, which is kind of incorrect of me. At Golder, most people would usually put the date or like the year, at least, the year that you did the project. So you'd want to put the year, the locations. So you want to be as specific as you can. The type of work that you did, the skills that you used. Do not be modest. Be thorough. So... The proposals people will make the final choices about what to include in each one. So your job as an employee is just to include everything. So this little exercise here is about everything. So here's an example that I'm showing you again about. So water smart, detail, detail, detail. Give the, the site. You should give the date. So I hope that you're working on this on your own. Um, and so I want you to write one up and share. And I know someone's complaining about my slide view, but I'm just going to put that in anyways for a sec. So I'm going to put this back for you. I would like you to try this. And you can ask me questions at the way. Mm -hmm. So we have one, uh, one project uh, here, 17,000 pages. So, so Carol's put, she edited a 17,000 page book that consisted of 138 images and table of contents and index. So how would we format that in the oh, 17,000 words? That's better than 17,000 pages. So let's actually go back to this. Oh, wait, here. So let's edit Carol's into this format because one thing with proposals that you always want to do is you want to be easy access. So in other concise writing webinars, we've talked about you know, using bulleted lists and stuff. So this um, using, now only use like say two colors or one color, um, but you can use bold font. And then we want to actually say, so to format this, if we didn't want to say the author or the publisher, we could still say over here where it says water smart, we could put history of medicine. Uh, we could put the year here. So project experience um, editing right, would we'll be editing. So history of medicine, uh, 17,000 word book, and then edited with 138 images, table of contents and index. So put it here. So do you see what I'm saying? Same information, but just make it so it's more easy access for the skills. Yeah, and using the white space really helps. So even though the areas are dealing with public health, how does one incorporate community-based work? So I would just put like outreach programming, um, community-based, and then I would maybe put 
the communities that you did that in probably, I would include the sites and then I would include the topics. So I would call it community-based research um, outreach and I would say covered the following topics or educated the public. So I would put the skills in here about what you did and I would label it community outreach over here with the sites. That's what I would do. I was writing a contract last week for a new project, a technology app, and I had already done a functional spec, but after three meetings and a prototype, I was still struggling to get the client to sign off on the project. And after working on my UBC technical writing module, I changed the opening paragraphs to refer to the client's goals and objectives and got the project. Oh, well, that's great. That's great news. So, so definitely important to word it from the client's point of view. So that's kind of what this format does too. You know, make sure that the skills and the needs of the client. So try to look like the client and make everything really, don't just bury it in one paragraph. Make sure that you open it up into these, this sort of format that makes it easy access for people so they can see the, those skills right up front. Even though outreach work is not bench work or based in science work, I think outreach work is actually more admired by people. Like I know, so when I first started working at an engineering company, I thought that my education degree was my easy degree and my chemistry degree was my hard degree. So I always kind of thought my education degree didn't matter. And then I realized that technical people actually find communication skills sometimes difficult. So the fact that you can go and do outreach work and connect with people in a community um, is actually considered quite a high skill by those who aren't skilled in it. So don't be ashamed of it. Like I said in the red text, don't be modest, call it outreach work. It is a technical specialty. You know, outreach and communication is a technical skill. So would it be okay to do a resume in CV format to impress an employer? Absolutely, totally break the rules. Just like that microbiology webpage, do what's gonna attract people. Okay, we have another one here. Uh, since 2015, I've been working with a high school music program in the DC metro area. I've worked with all areas of the band and all areas of show design. The school is in one of the lowest income areas so our budget is significantly smaller than surrounding programs as the students pay no program fees. We make the small budget and myriad of scheduling issues work as best. Uh, we're growing the program every year, except for due to COVID. So that's a fantastic thing to put in. So we would call that, let's see. So is, would this be facilitating a band program? So I'd probably call this facilitating a band program. And then I would, put, so I would put it here. And if there's a name of the band program, so let's say like, uh, DC band program or whatever, then I'd put the name of the city. And then I would put, um, then you could probably put, um, you might wanna make it a little bit fewer words if possible. Um, so I'd probably put, instead of using the word I here, I might just make it really brief. So have worked with, um, have worked with all areas of band and show design. And I know you wrote this off the cuff bravely, so I appreciate that. So have worked with all areas of band and show design on a low budget uh, with myriad scheduling issues. And we've managed to grow the program despite clients not paying fees. See, So you can compress those words. And if you had time, you would be able to compress those words. You could also, by the way, use bullets or use you know point form if you needed to. So. Again, don't be afraid to break the rules. Once you know the rules, um, then it's okay to break them. And we always, less words always sells more. If, you know, being concise. So we have two concise webinars. We have concise writing and concise speaking and then persuasive writing. So those are all pretty much about using fewer words to sell more. Yeah, managing tight budgets and coordinating multiple person schedules are great skills for, yeah, for anything we tend to like downplay ourselves and think, oh, the hard skills, the math and the science are the important stuff. But once we get out there and step out, people really, um, really value communication skills. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be modest, write everything down. And especially, you know, if you're working with a company 
the more you write about what you can do, the more they can include it, the more opportunities you get. so